Top. Primero que todo, eh, Before anything. I would like to know if um, anyone has been in Colombia or if there is any Colombian person here. The idea is that I would like to show you the perspective of all that has happened in Colombia and to better Colombia. We have worked and tried to better during all this time uh, through exercises, um, through reflections, uh, cooperative work with um, businesses, and uh, through this, we have always tried to accomplish to promote peace. And one of our other goals that we have been working with Christian that I consider a close friend and a very special friend. He's also here. And as I continue telling the story, I will be telling you uh, what we have been able to accomplish. So I have uh, been, I have worked in emergency department in the hospital. Universitario San Ignacio, I work as a professor at the Pontis Pontici Universidad Javeriana. Uh, and the first thing that I want to make clear is that I don't have any financial conflict. So for you that have never been in Colombia or know where is Colombia, I would like to know to tell you first um, where we are located and who we are. The first thing that I want to know is Colombia is a country that has 40.1 million um, persons, almost 50 million persons, and have an area of 401 and 44 uh, miles. And one of the interesting things about Colombia is that we have uh, uh, three, dif four different borders. And one interesting fact is that more than half of our country, uh, we're talking about of um, green um, areas, forest. So when we talk about country, this is the area that we most of us live, and all that other area is just forest. So and in that other area, the uh, population is very few people living there. In order to be able to um, arrive to the persons that live after the forest, uh, you have to travel by river. And sometimes there are 10 days when we need to go over there. So. Um, the challenge that we uh, have um, getting to these people is not easy. I mean, it's not easy to arrive to them. Because the fact is that our most of our country is just forest, but we have a lot of diversity. the part that you see in the red sections are ecosystems and ecosystems that are in danger, especially these parts, the Guajira, that is in this part of the country, in, in the urban zones that they are very populated. As you can see, uh, there are parts that, um, there are zones that are very vulnerable. However, we still have um, uh, parts of our country that have a very low risk to be affected. And um, we have 
a very good um, medical system that according to the Health um, Association of the world, we are on uh, number 22nd. So for try to put this into context, uh, we will review the indicators. And we will review uh, that in the last years, um, talking about um, uh, tuberculosis and um, infant mortality, TB in this. So we have really make a great progress, even though all the challenges that we are facing. So as we clarify and um, uh, say that our health system is a good one, I would like to try to explain a little bit about the our health system and, and how it works. Like all system, we have a population and it has to be followed by institutions. These institutions are followed by different businesses and it has a, sup a financial support. So our public uh, health uh, system have two components. The first one is public and the other component is private. The, of those two components, public and private, there are different groups. The first one is the one that population that have no money or that they come with from other uh, countries that come to our country and that they are receive services and we'll call this system vinculados and um, all this population are um, attended they are taking care on the emer at emergency basis on the emergency departments and uh, those persons uh, are seen by the component uh, that are um, subsidized by the businesses and of course the government pays for these services. And all the um, citizens in, um, that uh, from Colombia that um, have um, a job or um, that work for the government, they they are seen by uh, something that is called re special regimen, and that's um, and the other the other persons are the persons that have that have a job, and each employee pays eight percent, and the employer pays four percent, and all that money helps to pay for the um, health for that person. So all that is a public system. The private, we are talking about um, persons that have access to insurance companies. So the government just controls, but has not um, control on the money. So let's see if we can understand more of the context. And we will tr uh, try it and talk about this through history. So I'm going to try to summarize it. So the Army of Colombia if you study history in Colombia, and we uh, talk about a hundred years ago, uh, we can find uh, revolutions and it has been difficult to stabilize, but we can say that in 1980, we start working on stabilizing the government and the politicians 
But at the same time, uh, different kind of groups start appearing because the difference between um, the Since 1964, he was the leader uh, that of ASFARA, and he continued um, organizing and giving orders to this group. And the focus was a communist uh, focus. And since 1980, they start getting together. Um, and create groups of uh, persons that they were, they agree with the communism. And try to create an army, an army that was just for the country of Colombia. And um, their goal was to get all the power so they will get enough force and um, take over all the government. And in 1982, you can start seeing many problems because they put many persons and try to uh, enroll more persons in the army. And the goal was to enroll 60,000 people and um, not only create an infra infrastructure and a, a component of communism. As you can see, all these images are images about the army. And those persons have been in charge uh, in part of the story that have been the head of the army and have affect or been affected uh, by the government, and there was the ones that have been uh, fighting and have been removed. Normally, if you can um, only hear the philosophy of the communism and uh, you can think that it is something that may be worth it. But what happened is, is that the goal was really that that the whole country was not really to fight the army or these groups that they were formed, but they were also um, fighting or affecting the whole population. So what used to happen is that the army or the guerrilla will go out to the area where the highways was uh, were, and they will stop all the cars. And if uh, they will um, find someone that had a power or they were a teacher or they were part of the government and they um, find that they will be um, a, they will be an asset for their fight they will get abducted and um, they will use them and they they have a name pescas milagrosas or miracle fishes And of those persons that were abducted, they um, will ask for up to 3,000 pesos to get them back to their families. And all this will happen into places that they were um, far away from the city. And I don't want to share really that many pictures, um, but there are some of these pictures of things that had happened inside the cities 
where they will attack um, parts of the cities that had nothing to do with the army or with these groups. And in 2003, uh, and they put a, a bomb car and exploded in a place that is, was called El Nogal. And they didn't care that there were so many innocent people. Um, he want, they wanted to kill someone from the government, and 32 innocent people died. So what happened when uh, they attacked all these towns? What happened is that they have other roles. And their goal was really to find more money and to really um, get money through different ways. And everything was work uh, between politicians, Andres Pastrana and Bill Clinton. The goal was back then, it was to create a um, group that will help with um, to fight these uh, groups that they were involved in narco traffic. And up to, to, up to today, we, until 2016, we have uh, invested more than $286 million. And uh, presently, we have invested more than $19 billion. And um, all this is with the goal to try to um, put order on this situation or be able to handle the situation. One of the things that happens in Colombia is that we don't have a great army. And what they try to do is to create a special group that is was called FUDRA, that it was a rapid deploy force. And in less than one day, they will um, transport they will deploy up to 2,000 of these soldiers to try to fight all these groups. So to say that as far was only the problem, it is not the truth, it's not correct, because we still have problems. And many of these are still present. And when the following pictures, I hope to show still the problems. There are groups that is called paramilitares that if you can review the history, you will find out that they have been since uh, the years of 1960, where um, back then it was legal to start some groups to fight some um, groups, like to fight as Fargo and La Garrilla. And as the years went through, they start uh, practicing uh, similar forms of what they fight as the guerrillas. So they start fighting from the Colombian army to the guerrillas and to the defense and the auto military groups. They start fighting between each other, and there were many murderers. And um, it happened that. From one group, they start fighting to the other group. And you will see what happened after um, they fight to each other. So after, after 2000, uh, they try to implement a plan to try to bring peace. In, the, in 2008, uh, that's when they created a United Cell Defense Force, and um, they created this group, Black Eagles. 
another group that was created is called Ejército de Liberación Nacional, ELN, and continues to create conflicts in our country. Um, in the January 14 of last year, he put a bomb in the um, military academy, and it has almost the same origin in, and uh, the same goals as the communist regime. The other thing is that if these groups didn't have the right finances, they have never got the response uh, to national um, problems. So whoever has seen or heard about narcotraffic, you can um, have, I'm sure you have heard about Pablo Escobar. His goal was to control all the components and all the parts of the government. And when he was not able to do it, then he started um, killing, putting bombs, and affect and create confusion and insecurity in our population. So if we uh, had to summarize all that I have said, we have three uh, principal groups, ELN, ELN, EPL, and El ASFAR. LPN, that is the uh, army that has less impact in our country. And if you can see this uh, graphic, they are all uh, close to the city. But with the time, that changed. This is what we can summarize from 1965 to 2013. And these are the principal states, which is Santokia, and Cauca, that is this area. All those areas have a lot of mountains, forests, and they are not easy to access. And that's the reason because all those um, insurgent groups have um, grow in that area. All, through all these years, all these red points, is um, the Carca and Cordoba, the uh, paramilitaries were for a long time in that area. And in that area, the Cocota city that is very close to Venezuela and Arauca, that is a, a point that it is also very close, that it was um, part of as far. And they were. Um, close to Venezuela. So on the right graphic, you can see that there are changes. You can see that during the paramilitar um, time, and through the years, you can see that the attacks start increasing rapidly. Entre 2000 and 2005, you can see the differences. Um, where the new presidents uh, took power over the country. And through the years, the attacks start um, diminishing. If we have to summarize all the homicides and attacks through these years, so you can say that the area um, of plantains is this area. And this area is important because the access is a limited access in the area of the Cauca. That is an area that has was very affected. And this area is called the Meta. That's where the um, asphalt was there. So, so far we can say that Colombia had had a 
difficult development had three presidents that fight to get support and um, fight for recovery and um, be able to explain what was happening to go back to the control in their country through democracy. Um, with, the, with this president, what happened is that um, it tried to get over control to this country, and it somehow we can say that things are better. And uh, the last thing that had happened was the defense, um, um, the person that is in charge of defense. Uh, you can see in that picture that um, these persons over here, they were fired by the defense of the peace. And this was uh, able to happen So with, with the last uh, president, what happened is that the government was able to prove that with peace, um, they can achieve what they need, not through, through fighting, through war. So with this strategy, since 2012, the last president, Santos, at the moment that he's elected, the communication starts. And he is the one that signs the, the peace agreement with Asfarta. And that happened in 2016, four years after her um, term and that was the base of his reelection to continue. And when you analyze the steps of the conflicts, you can see this graphic in that part where you can see that the way that we were that we were able to accomplish peace was through all these steps. So the, the peace agreement where they were um, treated together with Cuba, there was many um, held um, So this peace agreement, uh, they, it was stated that there were um, many issues, politics, and working through the better the economy and agriculture. Um, agriculture reform, so w everybody can had access to um, to medical services. And here we can we can um, see how how can uh, the persons that used to fight in this group have access to medical health services. Christopher Reynolds, Lince, Christian, we were together and we wanted to analyze and see if we could find problems or if we could find any barriers that um, persons were going through um, after 
after the peace agreement. Part of that agreement was that instead of taking to jail, uh, they created these spaces uh, that is called spaces for capacitation and reincorporations. ETCR, uh, so these centers, 24 were created. And the idea was that in these places, there was this space where they will pay their time for their crimes, but also they will reintegrate into the society through uh, different social programs um, where um, that they will learn while they were in these uh, places. So we went and uh, visit all these uh, spaces, and uh, we wanted to study uh, how their health uh, was over there. So we did two things. One, we did a survey to all the health providers that they were in charge of the um, a health for the ASFAR, as well to provide the same survey to all the different areas in Colombia where they were providing health services. And Where, you, where this arrow is, that's one of the uh, places that we visit, Vista Hermosa Meta. You have to go through Bogota and then El Llano. You have to travel about two hours. And then uh, we have to travel six to eight more hours through highway to arrive to the place that it was in the arrow. And we were able to find 32 participants, and we did the survey to 25 health care providers, to seven fire health promoters. And we can con conclude that we find two important things. First, that we have a stigma component, the one that they perceive, but not from the healthcare providers, but the whole access to health. Plus, even though they have a great health system, they, there is a lot of problems accessing to health. And so uh, we really can conclude that it is difficult for persons that live in rural areas to have the right access to healthcare services. In this graphic, you can see um, all the barriers that we found during these interviews and surveys. We found a lot of limitations, but probably is not only centered on them, but maybe it's just a sample of the whole population um, that it is uh, vinculated to the stigma to the ASFAR. Another way we can say that uh, the, the person that belong to ASFAR, they have their on healthcare um, providers. And we talk to them, and um, when the providers will go, they will stay over there 30 to 90 days over there. And uh, they will do surgeries, like um, 
uh, remove appendix. And we find out that they were not uh, doctors. They were persons that received training, and but their training was really in army, and somehow they were trained and to do this kind of emergency um, surgeries. Many of them, they were looking to better this healthcare system. The following that I will um, talk about are the barriers that we identify. Many of them are similar to the ones that they already happen to the persons that have those barriers accessing the healthcare. So, in base of that, we ask this. So, um, may, is it maybe that the doctors don't want to treat the patients, or because they have, uh, because the doctors that have um, treat people? and they have um, been victims of um, kidnappings, or um, I have friends that uh, their parents were kidnapped and murdered. So as a person from outside, you may think, well, you know, maybe that's a component that is um, preventing the doctors to provide the right care for patients. So we decided to complete this study, and we did it together with the Association of the Emergency in Colombia, and they helped us to uh, give this survey around Colom uh, all over Colombia. We did um, a 50-question survey, and um, these are the most important questions. And these were directed to the doctors that um, give, um, that provide services, health services to the patients. One of the things that happened in our hospital, uh, our hospital is a very complex. And one of one time I have to provide treatment to the ASFAR leader. How did I recognize him? Because I will see him every day in TV. But really, as a doctor, you cannot really don't recognize who is part of the ASFARC. And so what I'm trying to say is that um, a, as a doctor that uh, was um, put in that position, uh, sometimes uh, it can be kind of a difficult situation to treat and be assertive and not judgmental to those patients. So this is uh, a graphic about what the doctors wanted to participate in providing services, but the problems that they have. And now we talk about about a little bit of the conflict that had happened in Venezuela. Venezuela, as we say, it also has its own history. And I would like to tell you a little bit about it. Venezuela has a very important history, had many revolutions, many wars, and in 1910, where they have a lot of debt, they find oil. And that's how they were able to get out of debt. And uh, many persons start having a lot of money because of that discovery. Uh, however, they also start uh, getting a, a, a difference Último between día de febrero, rich and poor. Cuando la policía metropolitana, las fuerzas armadas uh, y la Guardia Nacional salieron a controlar la calle, 
y se produjo el caracazo. You la can calle see over here, su paciencia uh, frente a las medidas de ajuste de Carlos Andrés Pérez. This part of this video that el gran shows, viraje um, llamó el gobierno al plan del Caracaso Fondo Monetario. In 1989. Lamentablemente, por ahora, los objetivos que nos planteamos no fueron logrados en la ciudad capital. Es decir, nosotros acá en Caracas no logramos so controlar el poder. Ustedes lo hicieron muy bien por allá, pero ya es tiempo um, here, de evitar más derramamiento de sangre, ya es tiempo de reflexionar y vendrán Hello. nuevas situaciones y el país tiene que enrumbarse definitivamente hacia un destino mejor. Um, en 1992... Chávez lideró un intento de golpe de Estado contra el presidente. En 1992, where, after the Caracaso, where um, uh, President Chávez, that was part of the army, um, he decided to do something that is called a golpe de Estado. And that's when Chávez... Um, tells everybody that he will not continue. And he say, I accept that I have lost for the moment. And he is transferring to jail. After two years, he is put in freedom. The, the president at that time decided to let him free. And he decides to run for president. For the following four years, he worked um, to try to uh, change the country. One of these countries that had, it was a rich country that had a lot of resources. With the way of the subsidized, with the, where everybody in that country, the amount of expenses that each citizen had. And myself, I was part that I experimented that uh, when you live at the, in the border from Colombia to Venezuela, like I will take my car over there. And for the whole um, week, uh, my, ga my um, gasoline will be only $2. So, but things start changing after Chavez um, it, it starts um, decides to um, fight for the presidency and it starts uh, making changes, and all the persons that they were misinformed really were the ones that start supporting him. He is elected president in 1998. And he, the one that made a golpe de estado, they made him a golpe de estado for only one day. And they tried to control that growth that, um, that Chavez was accomplishing. But um, the, the country was not able to control all those political uh, parts. So, He gets reelected as a president in 2007 and in 2012. In the last year, he, got, he gets diagnosed uh, with colon cancer. He deteriorates. And uh, even though he receives all the treatments available, um, uh, he uh, dies and after he dies uh, he uh, the president um, that assumes the presidents was maduro and the reason because i mentioned this is because in 10 years chavez expropriated or control or took the power of um, 1200 um, businesses uh, that that they were international. 
so many of them close or they were close Two hundred and fifty six companies of uh, petroleum. The geopolitical component before it was a, cap a capitalist country. After being a capitalist country, he became it becomes a communist country <laughs> and uh, through a revolution, they put it a, a Bolivian country. So after they being the first of uh, petroleum pro uh, produ petroleum producers, um, they stop producing. And uh, when that happens, uh, the BA the, con the persons that live in the country, the amount of money now that you need in order to buy something as simple as a burger, like McDonald's, that is $6.13, it equals to 115,000 bolivars. So the inflation has um, arrived to something so extreme that we're talking about millions of percentage. And in 2019, we are um, thinking that it will be 10,000 of millions. So where you see the yellow line, uh, those are the um, the population that live in extreme poverty. And if you can see all these indicators, you can see that everything is deteriorating with time. So what happens with this country? What happens after this politic happens? So people didn't have any income, uh, stopped starving, there was no food. So what happens? So all the Venezuelans start immigrating, leaving their country. And you were able to see uh, all this migration of people. So people need to start walking. And from the city that I was talking to you about, and they have to walk up to 1,200 miles and uh, through this um, walk, there is a lot of suffering trying to escape. That equals to 1,260,000 that have migrated to Colombia. But the non-official um, statistics say that is one more million. And so this is a graphic that shows all those other um, countries that Venezuelans have to immigrate, leaving everything in Venezuela, because there is nothing that they can sell in Venezuela. So Venezuelans leave everything just with their clothes in their hands and leave, try to find another place. And that used to happen to Colombians before 1985, when all the violence started in Colombia. So that's the same thing that is happening right now to Venezuela. So what is happening right now? The first thing is that there is not an income. Well, the people don't eat. And if the people don't eat, then if someone has the possibility to go and work in any other place, well, they will go. And that's what is happening right now. That's the graphic and how people are living and where they have arrived, which countries. So 
and all the professionals have left their country, doctors, engineers, uh, academics. Talking about uh, infectious diseases, there is always a component of um, register that they really are not uh, factable, that they are not, um, the data is not accurate. Even though they may not be completely um, truthful, so there is bacteria, the pertussis, malaria, and all the cases that are preventable. Of sarampion, those um, illnesses that they were under control. So why did Venezuela get more affected? So uh, when Venezuelans arrived to Colombia, they tried to get, we tried to vaccinate them to prevent uh, any public uh, health issues. Another um, another illness f through HIV that is affecting birds and um, the quality of life of persons uh, is something that we can appreciate in this data. Uh, in this um, state that is at north of the uh, Bogota, is one of the places that have more HIV cases. Um, specifically, we have received 48 cases in the uh, past months. And it's only, th this doesn't only have a component um, of health, also a social component um, when there is not a, a job, when a human, when a human being, especially women that have no access to employment or any other choice to feed their family, they finish in prostitution. And uh, so um, we were able to um, uh, find out that men, most of the prostitutes um, in Colombia were from Venezuela. Um, the, in Venezuela, the hospital crisis is just unbelievable. Even the persons that have the financial means to uh, pay for hospitals or for medications, they have to get a airplane to uh, Colombia to get just medical care because there is no um, no X-rays, no medications, nothing that it is just um, basic. One of the reasons that the Venezuelans leave is because the salaries are worth nothing. And that's the reason because they leave, try to find better opportunities in other places. And so that's what um, somehow they start giving training to persons. Uh, so this, this So these persons will get trained in Venezuela, and it will be something similar to um, a physician assistant here. So how much it cost in Colombia to treat the, Vene the Venezuelans? The conclusion is that we have all these problems 
there are two principal things that are happening. There are, there are persons that have a low income. One of their um, one of their barriers or oh, is that they don't have a uh, housing adequate inadequate housing that they have done access to effective health services and many um, times they are ex they end up being sexual exploded. And at the end, all of them are paying, and they are in isolation. And no one has provided any um, the right access to social programs that we would love to offer them. So what does the um, health minister has done? They are totally aware of what is happening to them. And there is a health cluster that involves all the non-government agencies. And they are all involved in all the different areas. And they have four subgroups of work, the ones that they you can appreciate in this graphic. And that's what they are focusing their efforts in. Certainly, no, it's not um, human resources the problem. It's the financial income, the financial um, problems that we have. Because even though we can provide the health, um, the government doesn't have enough money to really um, give the right treatment. For example, one of the things happened is that in uh, the hospitals in Colombia, uh, many of the patients are more Venezuelans than Colombians. And we have a lot of um, steps to jump. And I hope that um, with this, um, you can get an idea of all the things that we are going through and, and be able to um, come together and help. I, I have a question about the criteria that use the health organization about how they that they, they use to uh, understand uh, how do they come out that we are on number twenty second. Uh, thank you for the question. I was very surprised to to understand that uh, we are number twenty two and we are have four subdivisions. One of is uh, the um, world organizations. And there are nine systems that that evaluate, but the one that um, has more um, is the World Organization of Health. The ones that the things that they use is about uh, the birth, the deaths, and even though they don't have all the resources. So they really have this different scale, and they are aware of the problems that we are going through. The Venezuelans, so the Venezuelans that are arriving, so how do they qualify for health services? Uh, they, we have four um, steps. So number one is the subsidized um, so any person that arrives over there is called subsidiary. And they can get like a um, permit 
that allows them to work. So if they work, uh, they get into the system because uh, in Colombia, as long as you work, you are part of the system and you are part of the persons that contribute. But if you don't have any income, you are still part of the subsidized part. They will provide you with health services. But what happens is that uh, since there is no income and we don't have a lot of money to treat people, we are going to run into problems and people may not get the right health services. Thank you for the presentations. What kind of help exists right now? And uh, what kind of programs uh, exist in this program? And how does the future look for the uh, citizens of Colombia? So Dr. Uribe, Uribe and other organizations got together are uh, trying to get together and create a system to work on it. And these clusters, they have been working for one year to try to better all these four areas. Because to be able to accommodate all the needs of all the population of two million people, uh, so to help all these people, we need to get all the the most resources um, possible. And we've been trying, and Christian, myself, we've been looking for uh, different ways to try to train and better um, um, the attention and the services that they get at the emergency level. And there are many spaces and levels that we can focus, and we went to help. There are agencies uh, for the for the immigration that is happening. I'm sorry, but I couldn't hear the beginning of the question. So two things. The, all the persons that are arriving we cannot control it. We cannot control all the persons that are happening between Colombia and Venezuela because the border is not the same, for example, to Mexico and United States. The frontier is separated by a river that is what separates the country. But one of the but one person that wants to arrive from one country or another they just cross the river. And there are some areas that are safer than others. And many of these roads are uh, used for traffic drugs that they are produced in Colombia to live uh, through Venezuela. And that's part of one of the reasons that there are so much insecurity. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are other countries that they are um, helping. For example, in Ecuador, uh, they were um, forced them to get a life insurance in order to get there. And so that way they put a barrier in order to get uh, a life insurance, they will have to have money.
So the initial mig migration started three or four years ago. The, f the first persons that start migrating were the persons that had money, that had resources. But right now what we are getting is that the people that have no financial resources and they, they, they are being affected the crisis. And Colombia is really never going to say no. Our intention is always to help. Is anyone has any other question? Does exist any kind of conflict between the Venezuelan and Colombians trying to accomplish the same things? It's a very difficult question. In the border, there are uh, many people that they are family members and they live in another country. As we can say, 10, 70 to 85. Uh, there, uh, before, uh, Colombians will go to Venezuela to work. And they live to Venezuela. And So Colombians before they used to live in Venezuela, but after this crisis, there are like two more millions of Colombians that have returned to Colombia. So really the conflict is only when they are in the army or that they are um, related to the police. The biggest countries like Bogota, Colombia, you can see discrimination because you can see that the persons that have no financial means, they can, they find that uh, the um, uh, ICUs uh, have not uh, a space because uh, the space have been uh, filled by Venezuelan patients. And um, especially in these big cities where there is limited uh, resources, those are the problems that we are finding. So the politicians, are they working in any agreement? <laughs> and I really didn't want to go on this um, on this topic because this is politics. And um, so what happened is right now, Venezuela is recognizing Guaido, the president. So Colombia is recognizing Guaido and no Maduro. Uh, because as uh, you know, these are the a president was elected by the um, citizens of Venezuela. However, right now, he doesn't have any um, power on the army. And the relations right now between the president of Colombia and Venezuela is zero. So between the borders of Colombia and Venezuela, Colombia was never, the border was never um, close. And um, uh, Venezuela has closed it. And in the about two weeks, the, the amount of people that left Venezuela is, is just um, unbelievable. Voy a preguntar esta pregunta en inglés. ¿Usted cree que debemos de hacer investigaciones entre Venezuela y Colombia y en Estados Unidos y publicar algo que ha pasado, eh, los eh, problemas económicos, sociales? Nuestro mayor objetivo es el poder entender qué ha pasado y cómo podemos componerlo entre 
eh, Brown University y nuestro equipo de investigación. Ese es nuestro objetivo. I cannot hear anything. So what kind of uh, medical assistance um, have to the ones that live in the forest? As I explained in the beginning of my presentation, it took six hours to 10 hours to arrive to them. Uh, and we have to use boats. Um, there are no highways. So when this person find an emergency, they really have no tools or mechanism to leave. So um, the recommendations for persons that uh, go over there as volunteers, they um, even um, uh, tell them about the astronauts to um, take out their appendix before they go over there. I go I would like to learn more about this. And uh, is there books? Is there a magazine? Is there any articles? And we are waiting for that. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>